A couple years ago, I sat down to solve a Rubik's Cube for the first time. As a mathematician, I thought it was important that I become fully acquainted with the cube. Not to mention, I found it really fun. After solving it the normal way about 20 times, I became interested in other patterns you could make on the cube. I started with some simple patterns like these ones. These designs are very nice, but I wanted to try something a little bit more complicated. I don't remember exactly what pattern I was trying to make, but for sake of example, let's say I was trying to move all of the top edge pieces around in a cycle without changing the rest of the cube. It looks simple enough. You can imagine picking up all of the pieces and placing them where they need to go. But after trying for quite some time, I could not get the cube into this arrangement, even with my trusty algorithm. It occurred to me that this arrangement may be impossible, even if it looks like I could physically move the pieces where they need to go. With hindsight, I can tell you that my hunch was right. I could not solve the cube in this way by moving it as designed. But what makes a given Rubik's Cube arrangement impossible to achieve with legal cube moves? Today we're going to begin to answer this question. We'll introduce the symmetric group, permutations, and the generalized notion of a permutation puzzle. Let's get started. First of all, we need a system to understand how the cube moves. Since the cube actions always move squares to other squares, as a first guess, let's just number all of the squares. Give me one second, I just need to unwrap this. Okay, here we go. So, here I have numbered each square on the cube 1 to 54. And as we move the cube, we permute or rearrange these 54 squares. But there are rules for how we can do this, given by the design of the cube. Before we start trying to figure out those rules, let's go ahead and simplify this problem to get a better understanding. I've recruited some friends to help me out. Instead of rearranging squares on a Rubik's Cube, let's think about rearranging these paper frogs. We can put them in whatever order we want. So I'm wondering, how many ways can we do this? To make an order, I start by picking the first frog, and then the second frog, and then the third, and finally the fourth. There are four options for the first frog. Then after I have chosen one, there are three remaining options for the second frog, then two remaining for the third, and then one remaining for the fourth. So the total number of orderings is four times three times two times one, or four factorial. We call each of these orderings a permutation of the frogs. The word permutation refers both to the arrangement of the frogs and the operation that puts them in that arrangement. For instance, this permutation can refer to the order 1, 2, 4, 3, or the operation switch frog 3 and frog 4. We will go back and forth between these two definitions, and it's helpful to keep both in mind. All permutations of n elements together make up the symmetric group, denoted Sn. We call this collection a group because it satisfies three specific properties. First, there is a do-nothing permutation. This corresponds to the original order of the frogs. Second, for every permutation there is an inverse permutation, which brings us back to the original order. For instance, if I cycle frogs 2, 3, and 4, then I can cycle them in the other direction to get them back in the original order. Third, if we do one permutation and then another, we get a permutation. This one is pretty self-explanatory. Let's go back to our row of frogs. We're going to mix them all up and I claim that we can get back to the original order just by switching two frogs at a time. So first let's switch frog one and frog four to put one back in its spot. And then we can switch frog two and frog four to put two back in its spot. And finally we can switch frog four and frog three and everybody's back home. <laughs> 
Now if we wanted to go back to the mixed up ordering, we just perform all of the switches backwards. This method works for any permutation that we start with. It means that we can reach any ordering of the frogs just by switching two at a time. In order to talk about this in more detail, we're going to need a way to write things out. So let's get some notation. If I have a permutation that just switches the first frog with the second frog, the only information we need to record is what happens to the first and the second, since the third and the fourth stay in the same place. We can write this notation 1, 2 to communicate what we did. We read this from left to right. It means 1 goes to 2 and 2 goes back to 1. Now, what if we move around 1, 2, and 4 in this way? Then we don't need to give any information on frog 3 because he stays in the same place. We can write 1, 2, 4 this time. 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 4, and 4 goes back to 1. Now consider if we switch frog 1 and frog 2 and then also switch frog 3 and frog 4. All frogs are involved, so we need to include information on all of them. We can write it as 1, 2, 3, 4. This means cycle 1 and 2 and cycle 3 and 4. This way of writing permutations is referred to as cycle notation. Now that we have notation for a single permutation, how do they interact with each other? Remember that permutations form a group. So if we do one permutation and then another, the result should also be a permutation. So let's say that first I want to cycle 1, 2, and 3, and then I want to cycle 2, 3, 4. Here is an important distinction. The number 2 in these permutations refers to the frog in place 2, not frog number 2. To help us remember this, I will label each place 1, 2, 3, 4, and we will move the frogs corresponding to the numbered position, as opposed to the number on the frog. Okay, let's perform these permutations. First, we cycle the frogs in places 1, 2, and 3, performing permutation P1. Next, we cycle the frogs in places 2, 3, and 4, performing permutation P2. Now we can write the resulting permutation. See that frog 1 is in place 3, so we start by writing 1, 3. Then frog 3 is in place 1, so this cycle ends. Next, we see that frog 2 is in place 4, so we write 2, 4. But frog 4 is in place 2, so this cycle also ends. Hence, we see that P1 times P2 is the permutation 1, 3, 2, 4. We can get the same product by just looking at the numbers. See that 1 goes to 2 in P1, and then 2 goes to 3 in P2. So 1 goes to 3 after both P1 and P2. In the same way, 3 goes to 1 in P1, and then 1 doesn't change with P2. So 3 goes to 1 overall. Now see that 2 goes to 3 in P1, and then 3 goes to 4 in P2. So 2 goes to 4 overall. Finally, 4 doesn't change with P1, and then 4 goes to 2 in P2. So 4 goes to 2 overall. Thus, this method also gives us the permutation 1, 3, 2, 4. Remember earlier how we were able to reach a given permutation by switching two frogs at a time? Let's see how that plays out with cycle notation. Okay, if I take the permutation 1, 4, 2, 3, then we want 1 to go to 4, 4 to go to 2, 2 to go to 3, and 3 to go to 1. So we can write this permutation as 1, 4, 1, 2, 1, 3. We call this a decomposition of permutation P into two cycles. In general, if you have a cycle of length k 
you can always write it as the product of k minus 1 switches or transpositions. We can do this by pairing the first element with each of the other elements in the cycle. For instance, if we have a cycle A, B, C, D, E, dot, 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 then we can write this as AB times AC times AD times AE and so on. If you can write a permutation P as the product of an even number of transpositions, then you can't write it as the product of an odd number of transpositions. We call these permutations even. Similarly, if you can write a permutation P as the product of an odd number of transpositions, then you cannot write it as the product of an even number of transpositions. We call these permutations odd. Since we can decompose a permutation of length k into k minus 1 transpositions, a cycle of odd length is even and a cycle of even length is odd. That's a little confusing, so I'll say it again. A cycle of odd length is even and a cycle of even length is odd. Let's consider what happens if we perform one permutation and then another. We refer to this action as multiplying permutations. See that we can write these two even permutations as a decomposition into transpositions. Then the resulting permutation can be written by first writing the transpositions from the first permutation and then writing the transpositions from the second permutation. This means that the resulting permutation can be written as the product of an even number of transpositions and is therefore even. With this, we can write a sort of multiplication table of permutations. We just saw that the product of two even permutations is even. If we multiply an even permutation by an odd one, then the resulting permutation can be written as an even plus an odd number of transpositions. Here, the product is an odd permutation. If we multiply two odd permutations, then the resulting permutation can be written as an odd plus an odd number of transpositions. In this case, the result is an even permutation. Notice that these rules are exactly those for adding even and odd integers. That's because we add the number of transpositions that the cycle can be decomposed into. Okay, here's the big takeaway from all of this. So if you hear nothing else I say, hear this. These rules mean that we cannot write an odd permutation using only even permutations. If we are presented with an order of the frogs corresponding to an odd permutation, and we are only allowed to perform even permutations, then we cannot put the frogs in the desired order. To hammer home this point, let's look at an example. Suppose that you can only cycle three frogs at once. And now we want to know if we can put the frogs in this order, starting from the original position and using these rules. Well, we can play around with it for a little, but we won't ever succeed. Notice that the three cycles are even permutations because they have an odd length. But this order of the frogs corresponds to an odd permutation because you can get this order by just switching two frogs. Since we can't add even cycles and get an odd cycle, there's no way to reach this permutation with only three cycles. This brings us to permutation puzzles. A permutation puzzle is a set of ordered elements where you can permute the elements according to the rules given by the puzzle. There are some extra conditions too, but we won't worry about those right now. The Rubik's Cube is a permutation puzzle, but there are some others you may not be familiar with. For instance, the 15 puzzle or the Hungarian rings. Numberphile actually made a great video on the 15 puzzle a couple years back. They explain why one of these patterns on the back of the package is actually impossible to achieve with legal moves. It has to do exactly with the even and odd permutations that we were just talking about. I'll put the link to the video down below. Let's go back to our simple model for the Rubik's Cube. If we could rearrange the 54 squares in any order, it would be exactly like having a long row of 54 frogs. 
This would be the same as taking the stickers off the Rubik's Cube and putting them in different places. However, we know that there are additional rules for how we can arrange the squares. For example, we can't switch square 1 and square 5 because square 1 is a corner, but square 5 is a centerpiece, so we can't get 1 to 5 with legal cube moves. In the next video, we will develop a more accurate model for how the Rubik's Cube moves and discuss the specific rules for this permutation puzzle. We will apply these rules and what we have learned about permutations with the frogs in order to find out what makes a permutation of the Rubik's Cube impossible. I hope you'll join me for that interesting question. Thanks for watching! I'll see you next time, and as always, keep exploring.